Autism is a spectrum, having a range of traits from the most profound to the very mildest forms, with each identifier often described as being under the autism umbrella. Under the umbrella brings to mind images of safety and protection, right? Isn't it nice to share an umbrella with a friend, a sweetheart, a group? How about sharing an umbrella with a whole spectrum of people? I'm sure we've all wrestled with an umbrella in the wind, all been soaked in a sideways rainfall, and all seen umbrellas sagging and broken. So how reliable a tool is an umbrella anyway? Depending where you fall under the autism umbrella, you might be the one stuck under the broken tip, just standing there, getting wet. Or you might be pushing hard to securely tuck yourself into the middle to weather the storm. Or you might be a caregiver struggling to give your child the best place possible because you feel like if you don't do it, no one else will. I'm here today to talk about the spectrum folk with the mildest presentation. I consulted the bloggers and <laughs> carefully considered the multitude of options. One on the spectrum, also known as autism level one, also known as high functioning autism, also known as mild autism, also known as pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, also known as Asperger, also known as Aspergian as though from another planet, also known as Asperger's syndrome, also known as Aspie. You can see how Aspie won out as the favorite. Consider the following Aspie traits. You may be an Aspie if your very first friends were old people, babies, and the lady next door who wore silver and red tarot, and one day she gave you green jello with cream, which you hated and refused to eat, and ever since you've partitioned your food in a Tupperware pickle dish because you hate when certain foods touch. You study people the way that some people study animals, and sometimes they say, what are you staring at? And, and sometimes they're friendly and you think they might like you, but then you think they might not, and you're never quite sure which it is until somebody tells you off. You discover theater and you find your people. And they love you and you love them, and sometimes you give them advice and they actually take it, and when they do, you feel like the highest functioning one in the room, and you really like that. You go to a party and immediately kidnap the busy hostess for a private chat in the coat pile on her bed, and you don't know that when she says, enjoy the party, that she's really trying to get back to her guests, so instead you answer, I am enjoying the party, but after she leaves, you figure it out, so you stay there for a while because you're really embarrassed and you're fighting back tears, and because the smell of leather reminds you of your dad and it calms you down. You discover online communications, and you use all caps and send all, and your entire address book is upset with you for spamming them with that very important warning, but you don't even know what spam is. And then one day, someone sends you a really instructive email about online etiquette, and you learn to use save drafts and delete, and, and soon you realize that you have over 500 friends and at least three likes for everything you post, and you kind of like it that way because in real life there is no edit function. You only seem to notice body language when someone is in trouble. Like, like when they're struggling to drag a stroller over a snowbank or running to catch a bus and, and you feel your heart racing right along with theirs and all you want to do is summon your Asbergian superpowers to help them all. You eat alone in your office, but every so often you try the staff room. You're always late though because you just can't drum up the nerve. And the day that you do, it's treat day, but there's nothing but dessert left and you don't eat sweets, so you start eating the kale and parsley garnish from the now empty tray and lecture your coworker about the perils of sugar and she stares at you with your, you're not sure what 
So you tell her that you do indulge in a wee bit of dark chocolate now and then as a special treat, hoping that this new bit of information is sure to forge some common ground, but she gets up and clears her plate. So you go to the fridge and start checking expiry dates, and suddenly you're yelling at everyone for permission to throw out the yogurt. <laughs> Playing hard to get is nowhere in your relationship lexicon. <laughs> you fall in love, get married, and have babies. But you have no idea what comes next because your love life checklist in your journal with the Duran Duran cover has no empty boxes left. You are a terrible stay-at-home mom. So you go out in public to save your sanity. And it's because the whole world is, is your audience. And also because your own mother used to do the very same thing with you, so you already know the rules. You train your little boys to greet store clerks and to order food in restaurants and to look at toys without touching and suddenly everybody is so impressed and you feel like a great mother but you hate to go home because bad mommy lives there and the next temper tantrum is waiting for her at the door and it could be her own. So, do you feel like you understand the world of Asperger's a little better after that helpful list? I'm guessing not so much. This is my list. These are my stories. My name is Kim Zaglinski, and I am an Aspie. My oldest son is an Aspie. My younger son and husband have Aspie traits. I walk this world looking through the lens of Asperger's syndrome. It's, it's kind of like when you buy a new car and suddenly the very same make and model are everywhere. Behind every list, of common traits and diagnostic criteria, there are stories. Rich, amazing stories about real people. And I am one person with no authority over the realm of Asperger's other than how it relates to my story. When we suspected Asperger's syndrome was affecting our son, I jumped to action. Like with most things in my life, I researched, I attended conferences, I had conversations, I probably asked some way too personal questions, and I pushed. I was determined to give him as much shelter from the storm as possible under the autism umbrella. I didn't realize it at the time that as I was tirelessly working to shape him for optimal functioning, I was also shaping myself. You see, even though I was seemingly doing pretty well, I was a person in recurring social conflict who suffered rejection routinely. My first principal threatened to fire me if I didn't go through his charm school. We didn't know that we were dealing with Asperger's at the time. He was intuitive and he saw my potential. He was willing to look beyond my lack of social finesse in the workplace, past the first, second, and third impression. And for several weeks, we worked on facial expressions, posture, body language, volume, tone of voice, smiling, um, wait time, which is practicing neutral, non-reactive facial expressions. I don't know if you in the front row can see by the brow lines how well I'm doing in that department. <laughs> Neutral, non-reactive. <laughs> we worked on self versus other impressions, perceptions. And it was the hardest mirror I've ever turned on to myself, but I had to look closely because how Aspies see themselves versus how others see them is paramount in developing social-emotional intelligence. In the end, making a good fourth impression wasn't enough to win over those particular colleagues, but the experience served me well going forward, and I can say I'm ever grateful for it. In the early 2000s, autism professional development was all the rage for teachers, expecting to come away with a few more tools to use in the classroom with my students or at home with my son. Instead, my toolkit was filling with tools that had more to do with me. I listened to the personal stories of some powerhouse spectrum folk. Dr. Stephen Shore, who's quoted here, Leanne Holiday Willie, she's author of Pretending to be Normal. It's so funny, I met her at a conference. I saw her at a conference, and if you've ever been to a conference in a room of like 2,000 people full of Aspergians, 
<laughs> ass face. They all think that the, the speaker is talking just to them. And so, of course, at the break, there's this big lineup to talk to her personally. So I went to talk to her personally, and she greeted me with this, hey, Aspie, and that was way before diagnosis. So I was like, oh, she thinks I'm one of her. <laughs> Leanne, Holiday, Willie, and Rudy Simone, she wrote Asper Girls, so that's where Asper Girl comes from. And of course, Temple Grandin. I'm a Temple Grandin groupie. I think I've seen her four times, which is a huge compliment to Temple Grandin because I've also seen the Beatles' love in Vegas four times. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, through their personal stories, I was able to connect the dots in my own life. And, and I was diagnosed at the age of 43, despite the brow lines that was not very long ago. <laughs> Why bother? Why? Why bother naming it at the age of 43? What, what purpose would that serve? Well, why indeed? The pendulum has swung from societies of patrons and, and protégés to physicians, psychologists, and patients, and specialists of all kinds, hyper-medicalizing every little personality quirk. Think about someone you know who has a narrow, perseverative area of expertise and poor social functioning. Who comes to mind? A gamer, an IT specialist, an artist, a musician, a mathematician, a scientist, a professor, uh, a horse lover, an athlete. Not likely, but possible. Aspies tend to be uncoordinated. That that's why, not likely. Um, Aspies are everywhere. Your boss, your doctor, your dentist, your lawyer, ironically, a lot of psychologists. <laughs> Temple Grandin says that the first stone spear wasn't invented by the social yak yaks sitting around the campfire. And I agree with her. Probably the fire wasn't invented by the social yak yak either. I'd love it if the umbrella makers could agree on the various spe the specific descriptors for naming, naming the various degrees of autism, but maybe the fact that there are so many unique expressions is why they can't agree. We do not yet live in a label-free world that values unique individuals with complementary combinations of, of gifts and deficits, so labels are necessary. We need labels in order to get our system's needs met. People just feel more comfortable if they know a category to put you in. Funders sure do. <laughs> we all like to tick off our boxes. And since coming out Aspie, I have been met with a level of grace and understanding that I've not known since early childhood. I can work with my system's administrators in ways that support my functioning. I can be unapologetic in setting boundaries, freely giving of my gifts, and honestly admitting my limitations. I'm no longer bound by the need to be neurotypical. I can simply be me. So if you suspect you may be an Aspie, Asperger's can be a confining curse or an expansive gift. It can be a gateway to deeper understanding about self and others. It is not an excuse to remain stuck in rigidity and intolerance. Learn to listen. Learn to take criticism. Learn to reflect and to apologize. Venture into the realm of the socially savvy now and then, where you will learn that the art of conversation has much less to do with speaking and more to do with tossing the banter balloon and being okay with leaving things unsaid. Learn to enjoy the social game even if you feel like an observer most of the time. If you are a willing Aspie ally. We make snap judgments about people we meet based on our first few impressions. The most socially challenged among us rely on trusted others to cultivate the opportunity to create that fourth impression. Don't assume that the person with the corner office wants to be alone. Invite them out again and again and again and again. 
and listen to their stories, even if they don't come in the form of a published book or a keynote address. And when you're done listening, use your words. Don't rely on the shift gaze, roll eyes, exasperated sigh, combo, say goodbye, have a nice day. And if they compulsively start to clean out the staff room fridge, please roll up your sleeves and help them. And the next time you're at a party, try having a nice chat in the coat pile. And finally, to the umbrella makers. If we are going to continue to think of the vast array of autism expressions as being under the autism umbrella, then let's all work towards this. Umbrellas are designed to be a one-person tool. So either come up with a better umbrella or figure out a way to give each individual who needs one their very own. Thank you.